I should add to the preceding section that uh, what I presented for the total variation regularization was a very, very simple form and uh, that you can actually overcome many of the difficulties that I described, but it doesn't solve the basic problem with the whole thing, right? So um, at least the final outcome is also TV is not the ultimate regularization method that you can employ every time. Okay, um, so uh, let's continue now with uh, chapter four. And uh, I will hopefully remind you about the Fourier transform and uh, some properties of the Fourier transform. Um, actually, what I will do is uh, I will prove the simple formulas um, that we will now use throughout the lecture. Um, and um, I will leave the massive theorems, which are not so easy to prove, uh, to um, to Foster, uh, where you've and you've definitely seen these proofs anyway in analysis three. Okay, um, so let's start. So I want to talk about Fourier transform, and here's my version of the Fourier transform. Uh, let f in L one, and I still can't remember, let f in L1 of Rn, then I define the Fourier transform of f evaluated at psi in Rn as 2 pi over minus uh, <laughs> 1 over 2 pi to the power of n over 2 integral over Rn f of x e to the minus i x psi dx. Now, um, there has to be, I must say something about this, because this is standard in our community, but uh, there are several ways you can, um, you, you can define it differently in several ways. First of all, you might leave out the constant over here. And if you do that, then you get uh, a different constant for the inversion operator. So uh, the nice thing here is that the inverse operator will look like exactly like this one, with the exception of this uh, minus sign up here. And uh, the second thing is um, in mathematics, usually you put the minus sign up here. And now if you look in engineering literature, then uh, usually there's a plus sign up there. It doesn't make any difference, but it means that if you look into articles or if you uh, want to use um, numerical packages uh, that have been created by engineers, you always have to make sure what was their definition of the Fourier transform. So that's, uh, that's quite important. Okay, um, now let me hopefully also remind you of some rules, how we can compute with uh, the Fourier transform. So let F in L1, and uh, then clearly the, um, then the, uh, the absolute value of the Fourier transform evaluated at Xi is smaller or equal to, I take the absolute value here, put it in here, the absolute value of e to the minus i x psi is one. So this is less or equal to integral over Rn, uh, absolute value of f of x dx. And uh, this is the one norm of f times two pi minus n over 2. Uh, this is going to happen many times. Uh, that constant is really annoying, uh, but uh, it's there, so I can change it. Now, I claim that the Fourier transform is continuous, and uh, I prove that by taking the limit from psi going to psi 0, f hat of psi. Now, this is the definition of the Fourier transform, and now we look at this over here. Now, uh, since uh, taking the absolute value uh, of f of x e to the minus i x psi, uh, this is smaller than absolute value of f of x, which ex uh, and the integral over that exists since it is in um, uh, since it is in L one. So, independent of x uh, of psi, this is bounded by some function that is um, um, by some function that is integrable. 
And uh, so by Lebesgue's theorem, I think in German it's majorisierte Konvergenz, we have that we can interchange the integral and the limiting value over here. And uh, we find that this is the same as two pi over minus n over two integral over Rn. Now we take the limit from xi, xi going to xi zero, and this is continuous. So this is f of x e to the minus i x xi zero dx, or it's now without the constant, as I said, f hat of xi zero, and that means that the Fourier transport is continuous. Um, I will very often use that argument of uh, Lebesgue's theorem, sometimes even without telling you. And um, the, the reason is more or less always the same. The reason why that works is more or less always the same. Um, now let's assume f is a function from r to r and let's uh, assume that f is differentiable and is in L1. So uh, the Fourier transform of the first derivative is this one over here. Now uh, integration by parts means that uh, we must inter we integrate the f prime over here. So we get an f, we differentiate the e to the minus i x xi. So uh, that gives us a minus i xi times e to the minus i x xi f of x dx. We get a minus sign from the integration by parts and uh, the absolute uh, and uh, uh, the limits vanish uh, because f vanishes at infinity since it's L in L1. Now, um, okay, but this is nothing but i xi f uh, Fourier transform of f evaluated x i. So uh, we have something like uh, the Fourier transform of the first derivative is xi times the Fourier transform of xi times the Fourier transform. And um, yeah, that's it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, choose g of x as x times f of x, then you can everything, you do everything the other way around. So uh, this is defined as integral e to the minus i x xi, xi x f of x dx. Now, um, uh, yeah, right. Um, I plug in and minus i over here, then I have this as minus i x e to the minus i x xi f of x dx. I must uh, multiply by a to make make good for that. And uh, but this is nothing but uh, the first derivative of e to the minus i x xi. Now again. Uh, I interchange um, differentiation and integration, and this means that it's nothing but i times d over d psi f hat of psi, not psi, psi is gone. Okay, so uh, that means uh, the Fourier transform of x times f is nothing but the, uh, f, um, the first derivative of the Fourier transform. Um, we will use that in an, a little bit more extended way. So uh, let's assume that f is a function from Rn to R, and let's assume that alpha is in Zn. And uh, let's take the alpha derivative of f and uh, that's uh, so alpha is a vector uh, consisting of alpha one to alpha n. So I define as d alpha f the derivative that I get by deriving f alpha one times with respect to x one, alpha two times with respect to uh, x two and so on. And finally alpha n times uh, alpha n times the derivative towards x n. Okay. Um, Further, let's for any x in Rn define x to the alpha. Again, we remember alpha is in Zn as x1 to the alpha 1 times and so on times xn to the alpha n. Also, let's uh, um, define the absolute value of alpha in this setting as alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha n. Okay, um, then we have 
um, that d alpha f. Well, what is that? That's the uh, derivative. That's the Fourier transform of the of a function that has been uh, um, uh, derived the um, um, alpha one times with respect to x one and so on. So, but we know what happens when we. Oops. We know what happens when we take the Fourier transform of a derivative. Um, we get, when uh, taking the derivative with respect to x1, we get x1 times i. Uh, and for all of these derivatives, we get one, one monomial. So if we take, if we, um, uh, take the derivative alpha1 to x1, we get the Fourier, the Fourier transform of that is the Fourier transform of f times, well, the uh, x1 to the power of alpha 1, or psi 1 to the power of alpha 1 times i to the alpha 1. Now the same for x2 and so on. And so what we come up with is exactly this formula, right? So this is not the proof. It, it's, uh, so this is just a write-up more or less. Formalism. Okay, uh, now um, same thing if we multiply f by psi to the power of alpha, where this is defined via this, and take the Fourier transform, this is nothing but i to the absolute value of alpha, d alpha f of psi, and uh, again, that's ex exactly the same as number three. This, this time it's iterated. Okay, uh, next thing we'll need is, um, let's define f lambda of x as uh, f of lambda x. Then the Fourier transform of f lambda can be computed at, at, uh, at value psi, can be computed as this, so this is just the definition. And uh, here we substitute um, x to x over lambda. And uh, so we get a lambda, absolute value of lambda uh, to the minus m, that's the integration constant. Uh, this was already there. Oh, no, 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 no. One over two pi. N, uh, N over two. And um, yeah, well, oh, um, this this now becomes an x, and is that not a dx? That now becomes an x. Uh, the x over here becomes an x over lambda. I, I plug it in here, and uh, yeah, and we find that this is nothing but the Fourier transform of f evaluated at psi over lambda. So uh, we can also compute the Fourier transform of a function that has been deleted or um, has been deleted. Okay, so uh, what about functions with verschoben? Uh, um, I'll look that up to argument. So we define f of x as f of x plus a and the Fourier transform of this. This is the definition. All we have to do is um, um, is, insert, is replace and do the substitution x by x minus a. And uh, well, you see what, what's happening. You get a factor of e to the i a xi, f hat of xi. This one stays the same. That's it. OK, um, now two examples which are actually quite important. First one. Um, we want to compute the Fourier transform of f of x equals to e to the minus x square over two. Now, um, there is a standard way of proving that, and that one you have uh, in Forster analysis three, so uh, you might want to look into that, but there's also a very um, <laughs> proof with a very simple, very low excess, and that's, that's what I'm going to present now. So define f of x as e to the minus x square over two, and that solves the, the differential equation, the ordinary differential equation, f prime of x plus x times f of x is zero. Okay, now uh, let's take the Fourier transform of the whole thing. 
And um, then we find that the Fourier transform of F prime plus the Fourier transform of X times F is zero. Now, using what we just proved, this means nothing but I say F, I say F hat of Xi minus I F hat prime of Xi is zero. I mean, I'm, I'm just using the formulas. I think that was from number three. So that's the Fourier transform of the, diff of, of the first derivative and the Fourier transform of X times F. That's exactly what we computed. Okay, uh, so f hat solves the ordinary differential equation psi times f hat of psi minus i f hat prime of psi equals to zero, meaning that it solves exactly the same ODE. Okay, um, but um, they both coincide at one point. So uh, if we compute f of zero, uh, of course, so f of zero is one, sure. And uh, the value of f hat, the Fourier transform at zero is defined as one over square root of two pi integral. Now the e to the minus i x goes away. So this is just e to the minus x square over two times one dx. And that's one, right? Uh, using that formula that you hopefully know from analysis one, that uh, this is square root uh, of two pi. Okay, so they uh, are solutions to the same ODE, but share one common point. So they are solutions to the same initial value problem. And by Picard Lindelof, you can conclude that F is the same F as F hat. So the Fourier transform of e to the minus x square over two is again e to the minus x square over two. Okay. Um, Another example, and uh, this will be very, very um, important when we look at single processing. It's actually, for engineers, this is the formula they use all the time. And um, um, also, we will have to use it when doing image processing. Um, let's look at the following example. We have a function f from r to r, and f is the characteristic function of the unit interval from minus 1 to 1. Um, okay, then the Fourier transform of that is one over square root of two pi integral over r, but uh, since that is zero outside, it's just the integral from minus one to one e to the minus i x psi dx. And, uh, but this one we can analytically integrate, right? So this is one over square root of two pi and the integral is one over minus i psi e to the minus i x psi in the limits from minus one to one. Okay, so um, let's take the psi out because that does not depend on x. So we have something like e to the minus i uh, e to the minus i psi minus e to the plus i psi plus all these constants over here. Okay, um, that's the sign, right? We have something like e to the minus i x psi minus e to the i x psi. Okay, that's the definition of the sun of the uh, sign uh, with one with a constant two i. So that's exactly the same as minus the sinus sine of psi times two i. Just look it through. That's exactly what uh, what comes out. Now putting everything together, we have minus i square, which goes away. Uh, we have sine of psi over psi, and here we have a two over square root of two pi, so that's square root of two over pi. Okay, so um, this function, sine of psi over psi, we call the sinc function, and uh, with that definition, we have that this is correct. The only exception point, of course, is psi equals to zero, but um, then uh, if, if psi is zero, uh, we can immediately look, uh, see what it is. So if psi is zero, this, this is one, and this is then just square root of two over pi. So um, to get a continuous function, uh, so this must be um, square root of two pi when psi is zero, so sinc of psi is one for xi, psi equals zero. And of course, what you get here is a continuous function, right? Okay, um, there's a small extension to that, uh, again, um, in Rn. What if uh, we have a function from Rn to R, but this time uh, the function is a characteristic function 
on uh, the uh, um, on the product minus one of the um, of the um, yeah, <laughs> characteristic function of the unit interval in each direction. Uh, and this time you find that f hat of xi is, well, for every direction you get something like a square root of 2 over pi. So you will expect something like 2 over pi over n over 2. And then this sinks in all the directions. And again, if you don't believe me, just look at it. It's really simple. Okay. Um, so we could derive that um, uh, so we could derive that formula so we can compute the Fourier transform of the unit interval and as I said that's going to be very very important. Um, and another note is important uh, obviously the sink decays like 1 over x like 1 over xi if you take uh, sine sink of xi. So uh, that means that the Fourier transform of the L1 function, characteristic function on minus 1, 1, is not in L1 because 1 over xi is not in L1 for, um, uh, for R. Okay, so that's not in L1. So the Fourier transform, unfortunately, is not a function from L1 to L1, which is very annoying. Um, so in analysis three, you um, prove a theorem. It's not that hard to prove, but I don't want to repeat the proof here, uh, which I formulate as theorem four three. The Fourier transform can be extended continuously to an operator from L two, so on L two, and in that if the uh, if f is in L two, then the continuously extended operator is always is also in L2. So the Fourier transform in our sense is always an operator from L2 to L2. Okay. And the proof you find in fourth, I didn't look up the reference. Uh, if I, um, yeah, I must confess. And the other one I'm not going to prove, although it's not too difficult once you know that e to the minus x square over 2 is a fixed point of the Fourier transform, which we just proved. Um, you can show that uh, f uh, the Fourier transform is invertible. And its inversion is given by the function 1 over square root of 2 pi integral over rn f of x e to the ix psi dx. And that's the inverse Fourier transform. And as I said, the, you see the only difference between the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform is the missing minus sign over here. And uh, defining everything in this way, we have that f, tilde, f hat tilde of x is f of x provided f tilde uh, um, um, is in a space that allows me to take this Fourier transform over here, right? Uh, provided f is uh, f hat is in uh, L2, which is guaranteed if f is in L2 or if f hat is in L1. Okay, so these are some basics about the Fourier transform, and uh, we, in fact, we need much more. And uh, but I leave that for next week's lecture, and uh, I wish you a great weekend, and hopefully we'll see on each other on Monday.